Glass here with a very special edition. I'm calling this the coronavirus series because it's Zoom calls with knitters. And this is actually crochet in May, but I have a special bonus episode with Bristol Ivy. Hey, Bristol. Hey, how's it going? And Bristol and I have not seen each other in a while. And no. I think the last time we conversed was maybe the Blueprint podcast. I think it was because we like, we did like ships passing in the night at Vogue, but that's it. You were, I was just like, I have to go here. And you were like, I have to go here. So that was Vogue. Like that's how Vogue works. So it's the Vogue salute. You're kind of like, yeah, uh, it's, the, it's the escalators passing in the night. That's what, <laughs> that's the Vogue equivalent of ships passing in the night. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. So catch us up on what you've been up to. You've made a move. Is that correct? You've gotten married. I made a move. I, pfft, everything's happened. Yeah. 2019 was just like, let's see what else we can shove in there. Um, but yeah, we're currently, we moved up to Bangor, Maine, which is about two hours north of Portland. This is my office in Bangor, um, which I have escaped the house for a little bit. Um, we're, we're doing lockdown, but I get to run here because this is where all my yarn is. Um, and as per usual, I never actually have the yarn at home that I want in the moment. So yeah, so that's been a problem. Um, what else has been going on? Um, amazing travels, obviously that's shut down for the moment. So I am focusing on my new book, which is Knitting Outside the Box, Drape and Fold. It came out with Pom Pom in October, 2019. So we're doing a knit along for it right now, um, as well as the original Knitting Outside the Box book. So yeah, that's what we're up to. What is the knit along? Is it anything from the book or? It's anything from either of the two books. So um, knit, the original Knitting Outside the Box was all about how to manipulate fabric as you're making it. So like ideas about creativity, all of this stuff going on, but also then how to take those ideas into reality. Um, and doing so by changing the structure of the fabric as you make it. So increases and decreases, short rows, stitch patterns that manipulate your gauge, stuff like that. Um, and I had a total like come to Jesus moment uh, about three quarters of the way through that book where I was talking to my editor and I was like, I think there's another chapter. I think we have to do another chapter. And she was like, no, we'll do another book. So <laughs> drape and fold is all about how to manipulate your fabric after you make it. So thinking about people, the, all of those fashion pioneers that did amazing things with draping and fold, Madame Grey, Madeleine Vionnet, even like Christian Dior with a new look, getting at that stuff, looking at origami masters, how we can fold and turn and manipulate our fabric um, after we make it. Because like, why, why not? Um, so all garments from the first book and the second book are eligible. We're doing like discounts with the yarnies that are in the books. I'm hoping to do some interviews with the yarnies from that are in the books, doing like a fun Zoom conversation thingy. Um, because again, all of us are stuck. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's gonna be a fun end along. So describe the draping for me again. Help me picture it because right now when I hear you talk, I picture knitting a piece of fabric that's maybe a certain shape and mm -hmm. then afterwards sewing it, like hand sewing it into a certain shape. You're not wrong. Okay. You're not wrong. So what I'm wearing right now is Mihara. It's one of the pieces from the book and it is literally a long skinny rectangle that gets folded into a Mobius figure of eight and it creates a shrug. So you can't see it on me right now, but it crosses in the back and it does this, this big figure eight thing. So it's, it's all about, because if we, if we think about fabric and we think about sewing, everything in fabric construction is about taking a 2D flat piece of fabric and molding it around a 3D frame, right? In knitters, we have it easy on that because we are basically 3D printing. Like you, if, you make, if you make a sock, you are basically just 3D printing a tube. Cool, awesome. But a lot of the times when you're working with pieced fabric, you can't do that. So finding out how to fold those 2D kind of angular pieces of the fabric around a body, which is very not 2D, right? Yeah. <laughs> like you need to be able to figure out how to twist and turn and fold and pleat and do stuff like that. So part of it is about creating really beautiful structures and creating like Madame Grace and, and Madeleine Bionnet were all about just um, 
bias and drape and beautiful flow and Grecian fabric and all of that sort of awesome stuff. So it's about how to flatter a, a body, but also kind of push what we think knitted fabric can be. So yeah, so it's, um, I think like the five chapters in the book or the five different examples are fold, pleat, twist, overlap, and rotate are the five different ways I looked at how we can change the structure of 2D fabric. Rotate? Rotate, yeah. <laughs> I just get so excited about that stuff. Um, again, I'm a nerd if that has not come across yet. <laughs> but think about like what would happen if you took two squares of fabric, right? Typically, we would align them on those edges. Well, what would happen if we aligned it on that edge instead? Or if we had an L of fabric and we aligned it like that, what would happen to the drape on this side of the fabric? Did you just go bonkers with a, a dress form and muslin? I mean, how did you start? <laughs> I did a lot of paper folding. So as a kid, I was and am still kind of obsessed with origami. Like that's whenever, whenever I'm in restaurants, I do like the tiniest little paper cranes I can, man I can manage. Um, but that also has been a large part of my process as a designer. I'll just take graph paper and fold it and tape it and cut it and tape it again and cut it and tape it again and then unfold it and see what kind of piece I have to knit. <laughs> so I did a lot of that. But yeah, draping on a model. Um, one of the big things, one of my big like revelations in the end of the book, <laughs> end of the book process, and I was like losing my damn mind, um, was that we can really push the structure of what a garment has to be. So when you look at the fundamentals, this is so silly, but a garment is defined by the number of holes that it has. <laughs> so, okay. So think of it. Right. Exactly. Think like a it. face. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We need all of those. Otherwise anyway. we don't work. <laughs> yes. Um, but think about it, like a hat has one hole mm -hmm. and that's so you can put your head in it. And a cowl has two holes, so you can put your head in and take your head out at the top. Yeah. And are you can see that? I love tag. It. It's great. Um, <laughs> I pretend I own these. These belong to Pom Pom. They'll go back in the mail soon. <laughs> um, I promise, Francesca, I will put them back in the mail soon. Don't do it. <laughs> I don't want to. I love them. Um, but yeah, so things like cardigans, you need a hole for each of your arms and a hole for your body. Mm-hmm. For a pullover, you need a hole for each of your arms, a hole for your head, and a hole for your torso. Mm -hmm. Past that, you don't really need a whole lot. So it can, you can push the structure. Right? There was an artist, um, I think Hiroaki Oya, I think was his name. And he did this whole series of t-shirts that looked like letters of the alphabet. And they had the right number of holes. And so they just draped in these amazing, crazy ways but it worked because it had the right number of holes. So you can really play with the concept of like, what is a cardigan based on, does it sit on a body? Okay, then it's a cardigan. <laughs> so yeah, it's been a lot of fun playing with that in this and just kind of seeing what I can do to turn the fabric around and, and push boundaries a little bit. I love that so much. Now talk about some of the yarnies. I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't have them in your head, but. Oh my gosh. No, I actually just made a list the other day. Um, so we worked with two, um, two yarnies for each garment. Um, and I wanted to pick yarns. I'm, I got to be really, really spoiled with this book uh, because we picked a lot of yarns with a drape to it. So silk and yak and cashmere and merino, obviously, because that's like the, the granddaddy of drape and all of them. But we got to work with people like Mayak, and North Light Fibers, and Farmer's Daughter, and Kettle Yarn Company, and then some new up-and-coming people like Amores Yarn Studio out of New Mexico, Three Fates Yarns, we got to work with Blubby and me, so just like all of these amazing people. And we also focused on um, a, a very neutral palette for the book. We focused, one of my thoughts was that anytime I do a sequel to Knitting Outside the Box, I'd like to take like one color, Oh. from the first book and make everything that color. So we tried to go with gray this time, which I think probably could have done a brighter color because <laughs> I was a little bit, a little sad knitting gray for six months. But um, it was really nice to see like how 
all of these different yarn artists approached that color. Mm -hmm. So you approached the dyers mm -hmm. with this gray idea and then they brought the gray to the table for you. Most of the times we just went through their existing palettes and said, that looks like it's going to be a good fit. Um, and that was really good because it meant that we surrendered control a little bit. Like it was like, this is their idea of a neutral. Like I didn't have to be like, can you please make me this specific gray Pantone? Mm -hmm. 0108, whatever code they use for Pantone. I don't right. know. Right. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's when you see the whole stack together, it ranges from like warm brown grays to like bluey grays. So there's even like a peachy gray in there, which is awesome. That's from Ocean by the Sea. And it's absolutely beautiful. So yeah, it was just, it's, I'm not good at giving up control. <laughs> I'm really bad at it actually. So this was a good exercise for me being like, oh, it's okay. It's not, it doesn't all have to be me. And it means that I get to riff on someone else's idea um, of what beautiful is. I love that. I do love that too. And I can attest to different shades of gray. I have a very brown gray door in my apartment. Do you think there might be even 50 shades of gray? Oh, oh. nailed it. <laughs> um, I was going to say my, my apartment door is brown gray and my super painted the walls purple gray. No. It, it no, no, hurts no. my eyes every time I leave. <laughs> no, that's not okay. And the elevator is like a silver gray. So we have all of these grays happening, none of which go together. Oh. I feel you. I feel yeah. You. Yeah. So some items in your life have been canceled, which I'm yes. sure is so terrible right now. If I, you know what, I kind of, you know, those like late nights when you wake up and you're like, did I do this? Because I very much said at the beginning of this year, I was like, I want to stay home more. So, sorry, so yeah. everybody. <laughs> I actually have a moment like that too, which is too personal to share, but this coronavirus has answered that mm -hmm. and I'm going, yeah. did I do this? <laughs> yeah. Um, and like, I feel really selfish because I'm, enjoying parts of it. I know we were talking a little bit about this beforehand. Like oh, I am, yeah. The, the wild emotion swings of like, this is amazing to this is terrible. Like there's no, there's no like calm middle ground. You're just always like, ah, or sobbing. So, um, but I'm getting to do things like bake bread, which I've missed doing. I'm doing, I'm making sun tea. I'm cooking desserts. I'm doing all of the things that I didn't let myself have time for before because I was like, no, you have to be productive. You have to be moving at all times. And it's like, no, that is actually a really valuable thing. How has it shifted the Bristol IV career trajectory? I mean, how, how, what pivots question. have you made? Um, well, I, I had put into place that I was going to be doing less traveling and teaching. So that was kind of already, already set up. Um, but like even the small amount that I was going to do is not happening now. Um, so I'm working a lot more on getting into the super creative side of things. So um, gosh, it would have been like almost exactly 10 years ago now um, when I was in New Zealand working on sheep farms, uh, Neil Gaiman came and did a talk in Wellington for it was like a, a book festival that was going on or something. Um, and in like a, the four hour long signing line that I waited in, um, when I got to him, I asked, you know, like, and, and this was the point where I was like, I'm going to now pursue a non-traditional career. And I asked him, I was like, okay, so what happens if the phone isn't ringing? You know, like what, what do you do in that moment? Um, and he was like, well, that's when you pursue the creative things that you don't get time to do otherwise. And it's like, Okay. Okay. So I'm getting to do a lot of swatching. Like I don't, I don't normally give myself permission to try new things. Like I learned mosaic knitting a couple weeks ago. I've never done mosaic knitting before. It's really fun. I mean, selfishly, I'm kind of looking forward to what comes out of this from Bristol Ivy, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or from any of the designers yeah. who are in the same position of just forced halting. Yeah. yeah. Right? And it's, there are times like I, I had a submission call a couple weekends ago and I was like, oh, wow, no, mm -mm. brain is not working for that. 
-hmm. So there are times when I look at all of the stories of you, you know, like Isaac Newton came up with this during the plague and da -da -da -da. I don't even know if that's the right reference or the time period, but anyway, um, it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard to focus and stay creative in times like this, but I think what you do come up with is so valuable and feels so good because of that. And it really is like right now is licensed to play. Um, and I mean, obviously we have to do that within the constraints of like, I still need to make money. <laughs> and I still, um, I'm trying to figure out what this looks like in the bigger structure. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially with our community, like the fact that the PPP loan, the payroll protection program loan is already like empty. Right. It's going to be really, really hard on our community. Mm -hmm. But I also think that this time has been really good for creativity in taking care of each other and kind of lifting each other up and doing really good things to look out for each other. So I'm hoping even if we don't come out of this, you know, like with the same amount of money that we started with, I think it's, there's a good chance that we're going to be in pretty good shape after this. That's what I love about your knit along. I mean, anyone who's bringing the community together, because the one good thing we have going for us with this is we have technology and we can yes. stay connected. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can't imagine. imagine what this would look like without it. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's beautiful that you're doing the knit along. Do you want to point us to any resources on how people could join in on that? Or yeah. So if you want to go to Pom Pom Magazine, who's my publisher, if you want to go to their Ravelry group, there are a couple threads for the knit along. And there is a blog post on their website, and I'll send you a link to that, um, for resources on discounts and fun stuff like that. And Wonderful. I think... I'm not sure if the discount is still going, but for a little bit, it may still be going. I may be able to persuade them to keep it going. There was a discount on both knitting outside the box and knitting outside the box drape and fold, and also a further discount if you bought them together. So that's also there. I will check on that and then we'll send it to you. Okay, that sounds wonderful. I know I personally am trying to use my platform to encourage people to, if they have any disposable income, to just put it yes. into our community that we yes. you know, value so much. I'm counting on everyone to do that for their prospective passion communities, you know, if it's totally. books or knitting or, you know, whatever it is. And yeah. I know that not everyone has that luxury right now, depending on your, your family structure and your job, you know, et cetera. But uh, I am trying to use it to yeah. encourage people. So this is a really wonderful um, way when that I can participate. I think also there are people in our community who see the inability in other parts and they're like, I gotcha. And they're stepping up to take care of it. So I really appreciate that the people who do have disposable income are, are they're looking out for us. So yeah. thanks y'all. <laughs> Any parting words before we end our coronavirus? Oh, thank you so much. I know. Stay safe, wash your hands. Um, and don't be afraid to try new things with knitting because you can always rip it out and Hey, you've got more yarn to work with during <laughs> self isolation. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of ripping. I'm just mm. going, what can I, what can I, I saw you were that knit collage yeah. extravaganza was happening. <laughs> rip out the hats, rip out the hats. All of them. Yes. It's a delight to be able to do that. Well, thank you so much, Bristol Ivy. Thank for you. It was a pleasure, see always. I'll see you next see time. See you soon. Bye. Bye.